pleasure and honor, and I'd like to thank very much Dr. Cecchi and uh, Olivotto for this kind invitation and for the possibility to share with you uh, these updates on uh, the management of pericardial diseases with a special focus on uh, uh, pericarditis. We know that uh, uh, there are possible clinical diagnostic criteria, the guidelines uh, of the European Society of Cardiology published in uh, 2004 um, did not pre uh, present uh, uh, diagnostic criteria, but this may be very useful for the clinician in clinical practices. And there are a lot of uh, publication and uh, clinical studies on uh, pericarditis, and uh, um, th there is a general agreement uh, that uh, the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis of acute pericarditis should be done with at least two of these uh, um, four clinical uh, criteria, the pericarditic chest pain, uh, the presence of pericardial friction rub, the presence of typical electrocardiographic changes, and these typical electrocardiographic changes uh, are in the setting widespread ST segment elevation uh, and or PR depression, the presence of a pericardial fusion either as a new or a pericardial fusion or a worsening pericardial fusion. For recurrences, we know that uh, we need a previous history of acute pericarditis, plus recurrent pericarditis chest pain. This is the, ma the major reason uh, for, uh, uh, of the pa for patient presentation, but we know also that uh, um, we need some uh, objective evidence of disease activity because uh, recurrences are generally milder and minder, and so uh, the clinical manifestation of these um, recurrences may be milder compared with the acute episode. So we consider as the objective evidence of disease activity the presence of fever, the presence of a pericardial infection in the room, the presence of electrocardiographic changes, not just the typical electrocardiographic changes that you can find in, ac in the acute cases because we know that these changes are generally minor in recurrences, so uh, we have to look for um, uh, more subtle or minor uh, changes in the ST segment or T waves, uh, the worsening or the presence of a new uh, pericardial effusion and elevation of white blood cell or marker of inflammation. We know that the etiology of pericardial disease may be quite complex. We have uh, infectious causes and non-infectious causes. We know that in developed countries, uh, among the infectious causes, viral causes are considered or presumed to be the most important one, and uh, especially Coxsackie uh, virus, Ecovirus, adenovirus, but also herpes virus, and especially Epstein var virus, and also more recently parvovirus. Uh, among the bacterial causes, the most important cause uh, is tuberculosis, and tuberculosis should be ruled out. But we are also increasing reports uh, of other possible etiologies, such as Coxiella burnetti, especially in France, while other causes, such as uh, fungal and parasitic causes, are quite rare. Among the non-infectious causes, we have an emerging form represented by autoimmune and autoinflammatory cases. We have uh, pericardial injury syndromes, and uh, we include uh, uh, postmyocardial infarctal syndromes, but especially the postpericardiotomy syndrome. We have also increasing cases uh, of post-traumatic uh, forms, especially after iatrogenic tra trauma because of the increasing use of interventional techniques in cardiology, so cases related to uh, ablation of arrhythmia. Uh, implantation of pacemakers uh, or uh, also coronary angioplasty. We have also the traditional autoimmune causes, uh, systemic uh, autoimmune diseases, especially systemic lupus erythematosus, Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic sclerosis, but also systemic vasculitis, especially the Bechet syndrome, and uh, also anti-inflammatory causes, especially the familiar Mediterranean fever. We have neoplastic causes, especially secondary metastatic tumors, and we have especially to roll out in this patient um, lung cancer and breast cancer or leukemia and lymphomas. Other causes are rare. Um, so uh, there is an emerging uh, role of immunomediated cases, uh, and because we know that damages, different kind of damages of the pericardial, but also of the pleura, uh, that may be induced by viruses, surgery, inf um, infarction, trauma, or bleeding, may lead to the exposure or release of pleuropericardial antigens, and this may lead to autoreactive uh, pathway with traditional uh, development of anti-heart antibodies or uh, uh, autoimmune uh, uh, phenomena related to, the, uh, cell, to cells, but we have also uh, the evidence of the presence of autoinflammatory disease, uh, a group of genetic disorders characterized by primary dysfunction of the innate immune systems. The most important one are the familial Mediterranean fever, especially uh, important in the Middle East, 
it is an autosomal uh, recessive disease. We have some mutations that have been uh, um, uh, recorded. And um, the typical presentation is that of attacks uh, of fever in association with uh, uh, polycerositis. And uh, we have also the um, traps, the tumor necrosis factor receptor as, uh, associated periodic syndrome. It is an autosomal dominant form with a typical presentation with an onset uh, from late infancy to adulthood, including long lasting recurrent fever episodes. And uh, we know that we have also red flags in pericarditis for uh, these auto inflammatory forms. The red flags that should be considered are especially the familial clusterings, the spontaneous periodic clinical course not related to the therapy. And uh, we know that pericarditis may occur in 20 to up to 50 percent of cases. We know that some patients may have these atypical forms, and these red flags may be useful just to have an, uh, to identify these patients. In Italy, uh, familiar mediatan fever is uh, absolutely rare. We don't have a patient with uh, um, so far patient with this disease in Italy, but we have uh, uh, about 6% of cases that carry a mutation for the uh, tumor necrosis factor receptors gene, and the CRT protein is very useful in these uh, uh, patients for uh, the follow-up of the disease, and uh, specific therapies um, such as anakinra may be quite useful for cases that are refractory to conventional therapy. However, in the clinical practice, most cases still uh, remain idiopathic with a conventional diagnostic approach. We have uh, several uh, European uh, uh, unselected series, and uh, with a conventional approach, we generally exclude uh, the most important specific causes, that is, causes such as neoplastic causes that are reported from 5 to 7 percent of cases, tuberculosis reported in uh, up to 4% of cases, and autoimmune or heart inflammatory etiologies reported uh, from 2 to 7% of cases, while purulent cases are quite rare. So what is really important in the clinical practice is to rule out these forms, uh, because uh, for these forms we may have specific therapy, and obviously therapy of the pericarditis should be etiology target as much as possible, but this uh, is not the case in many cases and uh, in the clinical real world. And so we have to consider also epidemiological features because um, tuberculosis is the most important cause of uh, um, pericardial diseases all over the world. If we compare the largest uh, uh, series from Africa with the largest European one, we see that tuberculosis is responsible of about 70% of cases in South Africa. And it is especially frequent in the setting also of HIV infection uh, in these uh, uh, countries, while in Italy and in Europe, but the situation is quite the same also in the US, uh, the frequency is quite low, less than 4% of cases. So the um, epidemiology, the ethnicity is important. Immigration may change uh, the epidemiology of pericarditis even in Western Europe and North America, and we should be aware of it. And uh, so the um, presentation should uh, guide also the, our treatment. We have red flags for also for this patient of pericardately, and luckily, if, even if we have a lot of possible causes, we uh, may have a, a clinically oriented etiology search, not an etiology search uh, for every possible etiologic agent, but that will be not possible. But we have some specific features at presentation that may be helpful to identify the iris patient patient that may be at a risk of a non-idiopathic non-viral etiology, and also patient that are at risk of complication. And these features have been validated in a prospective core study, including the 453 patients. And in multivariable analysis, we found that uh, high fever, subacute course, large effusion, or cardiac tamping in the presentation are risk factors for a non-idiopathic non-viral etiology. But also, with a short-term follow-up, also the uh, failure of aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug should be considered as risk factors. These two features are also risk factors for complications. So this, uh, it is very important at presentation to look for these uh, red flags because they, can, they may be associated uh, with a higher risk of having a bacterial and neoplastic etiology. And so what has been proposed is a sort of uh, clinically oriented etiologic search for patients with pericarditis with the triage of the patient. If we have a di diagnostic criteria for pericarditis, we may have the diagnosis. We have to consider the clinical presentation and uh, uh, the clinical presentation should guide the etiology search. 
uh, if uh, we have specific uh, etiology that is highly suspected because of the ethnicity, because of the presentation, then we can consider the, to do uh, um, uh, this uh, etiology search to perform admission of the patient. But as probably happens in most cases, we don't have any, any, any particular suspicion. So we have to evaluate these risk flags for pericarditis. Major uh, are considered the features that had been validated in the multiple analysis I've presented before. So high fever, subacute uh, course, uh, large pericardial fusion, cardiac tamponade, and lack of response to aspirin or non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug after at least one week of therapy. But we have also to consider the possible presence of concomitant myoc myocarditis, the possible presence of immunodepression, trauma, and or anticoagulant therapy, because all these, cases, all these situations may predispose to possible complications. So if we don't have any red flag, uh, the patient is considered for outpatient therapy. We, we, can, we can consider this patient with an empiric trial with a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. If the patient responds well to this therapy, the patient is considered a low risk, and uh, uh, we have to perform an outpatient follow-up. Otherwise, if the patient has some red flags, some poor prognostic predictor representation, or does not respond to the conventional empiric therapy, we have to reconsider the etiology surge in this patient and to consider admission. Uh, this is a quite practical way of uh, managing the, the patient with acute pericarditis, and the, this, the same could be also done for patients with recurrences, and uh, it may be quite cost-effective. Um, the empiric anti-inflammatory therapy is uh, quite useful in uh, um, many cases because we know that even if we perform pericardial synthesis or pericardial biopsies, we don't have results available soon. We have to wait for some days, and so we have, uh, however, to start the therapy in this patient. And um, what is generally reported in clinical studies is the, to, that aspirin or nostalgia anti-inflammatory drugs should be considered as uh, the mainstay of therapy for this patient. Uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, or indomethacin are the, the main free choices we can have. The uh, usual attack dose is uh, 750 to uh, 1,000 for aspirin, given three times a day. Ibu for ibuprofen, 600 milligrams twice, three times a day, and for indomethacin, 50 milligrams. And uh, uh, it is quite important to give these drugs every eight hours to have a full control of synthol throughout the day. And uh, how to make the choice between these three drugs? We know that um, in the guidelines, ibuprofen is reported as a favorite drug. But if we see the literature and if we see the clinical studies, most of the studies has been done with aspirin. Aspirin is probably the favorite choice for patients who already need to take, to take aspirin for other reasons. And uh, um, we have also to consider the patient uh, previous history, because if we have a patient with a recurrence and we know that this patient has a good response, for instance, to ibuprofen, we have to consider this drug before other, other drugs. And uh, uh, we have also to consider our uh, personal experience. Probably indomethacin is the stronger anti-inflammatory drug, but also the drug that may have more side effects. And it has been especially considered for, for patients with pericarditis associated with a systemic uh, autoimmune uh, uh, disease. Um, Nobody knows the, the best length of therapy for these patients. The guidelines tell us that you should treat the patient till symptom resolution, but uh, and, uh, no tapering is proposed. However, in uh, many papers, and there is also a trial ongoing uh, on this use, probably tapering may be useful, and it, it is us the usual practice in rheumatology in order to reduce the recurrence rate. And uh, we can also try to individualize the therapy because uh, uh, we want to, to treat inflammation. We want to, um, and so C-reactive protein may be quite useful. If we perform a weekly assessment of C-reactive protein, we can see that uh, in patients with acute pericarditis, about 80% of patient at presentation will have C-reactive protein elevation, but about 20% will not. And the main reason for this is in 50% of cases, because this patient uh, generally are very worried about uh, the chest pain, about the possibility they may have myocardial infarction. So uh, we, they generally go very early to the emergency department. So an early assessment of the, this uh, serative protein may lead to a negative result. But if we repeat the determination, then this patient generally have a positive result. Uh, in 50% of cases, however, this result may be related to the fact that they um, have a subacute presentation at the emergency department. They started some anti-inflammatory therapy to control pain, and this may have effect on this uh, um, marker. 
if we consider the weekly assessment, we can see that after one week, about 40% of patients uh, will have a positive C-reactive protein. Well, generally at this time, uh, almost all patients may be, at least the majority of them, may be asymptomatic. So it is important in this patient to go on with the attack dose till complete symptom resolution but normalization of the marker because it has been demonstrated that if we have a patient that is asymptomatic, but we have a positive test at one week, we may have more occurrences simply because we don't completely treat this uh, inflammation. So it is important to have an individualized therapy and sedative protein may be quite useful either for the diagnosis because we, it is a, a marker that confirms our clinical suspicion of uh, pericarditis, but also useful to, for follow-up uh, to guide the length of therapy and then during follow-up also to make the diagnosis of recurrences. Um, what about the corticosteroids? We know that corticosteroids are quite effective. The result is quite impressive when used in patients with uh, pericarditis. But we know also that the use of these uh, drugs may be associated with more recurrences and may favor really chronicization. We don't know really why, uh, the, um, but we know that one possible explanation has been that corticosteroid therapy may impair the clearance of the viruses. Another possible explanation is that generally the cardiology is very worried about the possible side effects of this therapy. We often use high doses. The guidelines report the, that recommend the use of one milligram per kilogram day of prednisone, so very high doses. And generally, rheumatologists don't use these doses to treat a patient with a, with a polycerositis or cirrhosis related to a systemic inflammatory disease. And uh, probably because we are very worried about side effects, we use either high doses or we taper the drug very, very quickly. And this is maybe quite a mistake because, as I, I've shown before, if the serotonin protein is not normalized, if inflammation is not controlled, this patient will easily have recurrences. So what is now recommended, based on the, the published experience, is to use low to moderate doses, that is 0.2 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram day. It is the common practice in the, the rheumatology setting for uh, the treatment of pericarditis in patients with a systemic inflammatory disease using a first uh, therapy length of two weeks for the first attack and two to four weeks for recurrences. And what is really critical also is not only to use a low to moderate dose, but also to use a very low tapering. For instance, for the average man, an average man of 70 uh, kilograms, we use prednisone at the dose of 25 milligrams, and then we taper it very very slowly, 2.5 milligram day every two to four weeks, and uh, the uh, we should be we should consider also the, the the story of the patient. If the patient has more recurrences, we should consider very low tapering for weeks. But if the patient is at the first recurrence, uh, the, the initial uh, recurrence, we can consider a a, period, a time period of two weeks. So um, this is very important, and the, the major evidence to support this recommendation comes from uh, this non-randomized observation. Uh, a similar group of, of, of patients in two different institutions were treated with high doses following the guideline in the cardiology setting, following our guidelines, and the other one in the setting of internal medicine was treated with low do, uh, doses, that is the do, 0.2 to 0.5 milligram uh, per kilogram per day, and we can see that using high doses, uh, we, you, we have more side, severe side effects, we have more recurrences, and we have more hospitalization. So the use of high doses clearly fails, uh, and uh, the uh, event-free survival is clearly worse in patients that uh, have been treated with high doses compared with those treated with low to moderate doses. Um, we have also growing evidence supporting the use of colchicine. At the time of the guidelines, uh, it was especially a recommendation based on expert consensus because uh, there was no trials to support this evidence. But we have now several trials uh, supporting the uh, use of the drug either for primary or secondary prevention. The drug is useful in at least two out of three patients, and it is able to uh, halve the recurrence rate. We have evidence for acute pericarditis. And this evidence comes from a single center open lab study, so probably we need more evidence. And probably uh, within the end of this year, the, we will have the result of a large multi center double blind randomized trial that will provide further evidence for agonists, the use of um, colchicine, even in patients with acute pericarditis, while we have stronger evidence to support the use of colchicine in patients with recurrences. 
We have a first experience published in 2005 showing the, that in a single center study, open label study, that the drug was able to have the recurrence rate, quite a good result. And these results were confirmed more recently also in a multi-center double blind randomized trial. So we have now strong evidence to support uh, the use uh, of this drug as first line drug for patient with recurrences. We have also good evidence to support the use of the drug also for the prevention of pericarditis in a specific setting. In the setting uh, of, uh, the, of uh, cardiac surgery, if we use the drug uh, uh, starting from the third postoperative day for one month, we uh, observed an impressive reduction of the incidence of the postpericardiotomy syndrome at one year. Um, this result is quite similar to the result of colchicine for the prevention of recurrences, as you can see. Uh, but the, what is really interesting is the drug is able also to halve the incidence of postoperative pericardic effusion, even without uh, the postpericardiotomy syndrome, and even the incidence of postoperative pleural effusion. Uh, the drug is effective uh, as an anti-inflammatory drug, and so it is interesting to note that in uh, this study, in patients that were not uh, in, uh, on atrial fibrillation, the drug was also able to reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation, probably because uh, of uh, his anti-inflammatory action, in a way that is quite similar to results that have been reported for corticosteroid therapy, but with a safety profile quite different because this drug is generally well tolerated, and especially surgeon are especially worried for the use of corticosteroid for the problem of wound healing, and colchicine will not have this, uh, any effect on this, uh, on this uh, uh, process. So um, we have uh, growing evidence that the drug is uh, uh, may be efficacious, but uh, do we have evidence of safety? Yes, we have also evidence of safety. The major side effect of the drug is gastrointestinal intolerance, especially diarrhea. Um, if in a recent in a recently published meta-analysis, we can see that compared with conventional therapy, because colchicine is used uh, as adjunct to conventional anti-inflammatory therapy, uh, we don't have evidence of more side effects in colchicine-treated patients compared with the patient treated simply with uh, um, anti-inflammatory drugs. We have a more evidence of a higher probability of drug withdrawal because the area is often a cause of drug withdrawal. So the drug seems to be rather safe. The, the side effects and the drug withdrawals do not affect more than 8% of patients, and when tolerated, the drug is generally quite effective. The recommended doses are 0.5 milligrams twice a day to have a, a full coverage uh, during the day for patients of more than 70 kilograms and 0.5 milligrams once for patients of less than 70 kilograms. So we have weight-adjusted doses to improve the drug uh, tolerance and the patient compliance. The, the recommended treatment is uh, three months for the first attack and six to 12 months for recurrences. The main uh, no anti-inflammatory effect of the drug is its capability to concentrate in white blood cells, especially granulocytes, even when used at the low oral doses just such as 0.5. And when in the granulocyte, the drug is able to interfere with tubal polymerization and so uh, with several functions of mycotables that are critical for uh, the inflammatory process. And this is the main no anti-inflammatory effect of the drug. So we have. Uh, now, growing evidence to support the use of, of aspirin and non steroid anti-inflammatory drug, the level of evidence uh, uh, is now changed from C, from uh, that was the level of evidence for the, for the previous guidelines to a stronger level of evidence. Probably the corticosteroids should be uh, used very, we should be very conservative and consider that these drugs only as uh, Ter third line therapies, we should uh, first of all use uh, aspirin or nostrum the anti inflammatory drug. And um, if one of these drugs fails, we should also consider the possibility to use another anti-inflammatory drug before resorting to corticosteroid. And colchicine is, has a, a stronger evidence, uh, uh, especially for the treatment and prevention of recurrences. And what about the prognosis? Um, most of us, and also our patients, are very worried about the possibility that uh, the pericarditis uh, may evolve towards constriction and to a chronic form. But we have now evidence from a large core study, including uh, uh, 500 consecutive cases uh, of um, patients with uh, acute pericarditis, that in a long-term follow-up, with a mean follow-up of 60 months, the uh, risk of constriction is really low, less than uh, 
um, one person in patients with idiopathic or viral pericarditis. And we can see also that the prognosis of these patients is quite good if we have excluded bacterial and neoplastic causes. And uh, with, with a very low recurrence rate and uh, um, incidence of complication compared to patients with a specific etiology. So we can see a group with a low risk, the, the, the group uh, of patients with the so-called idiopathic or viral pericarditis, a group of intermediate risk, pericardial injury syndrome, connective tissue disease and endoplastic causes, and a group with high risk, the group of patients with bacterial uh, pericarditis that are clearly at high risk. So the risk of constriction is related to the theology and not to the number of recurrences. And this is clearly demonstrated in this systematic review, including 230 cases of patients with idiopathic recurrent pericarditis followed for a mean follow-up of 60 amount, 60 percent, more than 60 percent were treated with steroids, no cases of constrictive pericarditis. So this is quite reassuring and, uh, for us and for our patients. And so let me conclude that now we are on the road of a more evidence-based management of pericarditis and pericardial diseases, and we better know how to safely cope with them. Thank you very much for your attention. Would you comment uh, on troponin in uh, high increase uh, in the setting of acute pericarditis uh, in presence or absence of uh, wall motion abnormalities? Okay, this is uh, an interesting point. Uh, um, this, uh, we know that there are uh, myocarditis and pericarditis uh, may share common etiologic agents, especially viral agents, so we have uh, overlapping forms. Um, these forms with the troponin elevation should not be considered as uh, as form uh, or as pure pericarditis. We we have uh, evidence of myocarditis in this setting. There is some controversies between pericardiology pericardiologists and experts in myocardial myocarditis for definitions. But uh, uh, because generally pericardiologists uh, like to use the term myopericarditis and perimyocarditis to um, to, uh, to indicate these overlapping forms, having uh, the term of myocarditis, the meaning of uh, patient with pericarditis criteria and troponin elevation, but without uh, abnormalities of uh, wall motion and uh, with uh, preserved uh, left ventricular function. And this patient generally, for what is known, uh, have a good prognosis. And uh, generally, the use of the term uh, myopericarditis in this setting would like to underline that probably this patient should be treated in a similar, very similar to patient with acute pericarditis. Um, uh, so for, however, we know that also uh, the expert in myocarditis prefer to use different terms, that is to use the term pericarditis with myocarditis or myocarditis with pericarditis. Uh, I think um, I, it is, uh, there is no problem to use this definition. What is important is to really be aware of the possible of the presence of these overlapping forms, and that probably from specific forms, uh, uh, for instance, for the so-called myopericarditis cases, we should be more conservative because the prognosis uh, seems quite good. But probably we need more evidence uh, coming from uh, larger studies and multicenter operation uh, studies that will have a long-term follow-up. Dr. Cech. Yeah, uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, I have three questions. One. Does this apply to children, pediatric, first? Second, uh, could we use, could we think of using colchicin, uh, uh, for instance, to reduce, I was impressed by the, the data, uh, to reduce uh, the incidence of uh, pericarditis uh, post-cardiac surgery? And the third one, the nightmare recurrences. I believe you have seen many. Myself, I have seen many. What do you do when they keep on going? Uh, you do pericardioscopy or what? Okay. Uh, so regarding the the, the problem, the, the first question, yeah. the pediatric case. Well, we unfortunately we have uh, very few data on uh, pericarditis in children. We have especially case reports. <laughs> Um, some re reviews of the literature based on case reports or small series. We have a small pediatric series that has been published uh, some years ago on the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, especially in the, the post-operative setting, in patients that were uh, um, submitted to surgery for uh, atrial septal defects or ventricular septal defects, having a high number of recurrences. And in this uh, specific setting, uh, the authors concluded that uh, aspirin and non anti-inflammatory drug should be the first choice should be uh, um, favored over steroids, and they had the disappointing result with colchicine. So there is a need of uh, 
of more studies on this use because all the study I presented uh, are studies on uh, adult patients. So uh, there is a need of more cooperation and more data on our pediatric setting because generally what we do, we follow the indication of the for adults, but we are not sure that really, obviously, we have those adjusted doses for the age, but uh, we have no evidence to support any specific treatment in the pediatric setting. F about the use of colchicine in the post-operative setting, uh, this is uh, the second uh, study. The first study was published in 2002 on arts by a, a group from Israel. Um, this is an Italian study, a multicenter study. Uh, we have initial evidence that the drug may be effective and uh, safe also for the primary prevention of pericarditis. This study was done in the post-operative setting that is starting from the third post-operative day and the treatment was uh, length was one month. So it is the first evidence. We need more evidence of uh, this data should be reproduced in other centers. There is an ongoing Italian multicenter study that uh, is called COPS2 uh, that will end probably in the next spring. And in these cases, the drug uh, has been given before surgery to, be more to have more evidence of efficacy in the first days after surgery, especially for the prevention of post-operative atrial fibrillation. And regarding the, the third question was the, oh, the recurrences. Well, it is a big problem. Um, what in our experience as a fellow center, we see a lot of patients coming from different centers. We think that uh, inappropriate therapy is a major cause also of recurrences because uh, uh, many physicians are especially worried uh, for the possible complication related to the steroid therapy. So it's quite uh, usual to see very quick tapering of steroids or use of uh, very high doses for short times. And, um, we have a very good experience for the use of multidrug therapies. It is, in a way, very similar to, uh, to, to what we do for uh, ischemic heart disease for, for stable angina. We use a combination of drugs to control symptoms. And this, this is what we do for pericarditis. We use, uh, uh, we use uh, obviously, aspirin or another non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug uh, combined with colchicine and also with steroids. And in my experience, this treatment is, is uh, very efficacious for the majority, not for all, obviously, but for the majority of patients, this treatment can be quite good. One tricky, one, uh, one um, important point is uh, not to uh, increase the dose of the steroid when you are tapering this drug and you have recurrences, but to keep the dose to treat the episode with anti-inflammatory drugs and then to taper very slowly the, 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 the treatment. Also, using serative protein to guide therapy may be quite useful for, for having very individualized therapies. Obviously, in, a, in, a, in a, about 5% of cases, you have really refractory cases. And in these cases, you may consider other therapy. One possibility is to consider immunosuppressive therapies. Uh, um, and azathioprine is generally probably one of the safest options you can have. Another one may be to use uh, intravenous immunoglobulins. Um, but it, most of the evidence is based on single cases or, or, or really uh, very, very, uh, very few cases. So we, we need more evidence. Uh, and in my view, in the majority of cases, you can safely treat patients with a combination therapy based on an anti-inflammatory drug called kissing and steroids.